the University of Michigan Division of Gastroenterology and the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Program host the IBD Visiting Professor Lecture Series in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This series presents the latest in clinical research and basic science from IBD experts from around the world. Thank you. So um, it's very good to be here and this is my second day, or my third day actually, and I've really enjoyed meeting the faculty and spending time with the fellows. It's been a really, really good trip. So my disclaimer for this talk is going to be that I am not a telemedicine person per se. I'm not someone who's an IT person. I probably couldn't even turn on the equipment back there. But I am someone who does have some clinical research uh, training and is trying to take uh, known technology and apply it to a chronic disease model, specifically IBD. So uh, this is the outline to my talk. We're going to start with barriers to successful outcomes in patients with IBD. Uh, I'm going to talk about some models of health behavior and chronic disease management and how we can use telemedicine, we can apply telemedicine to those models. Uh, and then I'm going to show you our home telemanagement system for IBD, some of the pre-testing and six-month pilot studies that we've done, and, as well as our randomized control trial, and then talk about future directions. Along the way, I'm going to weave in some of the small retrospective studies and some prospective studies that we've done at Maryland that... Uh, suggest that there's an unmet need in IBD. So what are our goals of therapy? Clearly we want to induce remission, maintain a steroid-free remission, and in doing so we'll enhance quality of life. And uh, to achieve those outcomes, we want to avoid short and long-term toxicity. So if your patient's poisoned with side effects, they're not going to have good quality of life and they're not going to take their medication. So those are our goals. We might want to add as another goal to uh, induce a biologic response and perhaps to induce mucosal healing, but we're not really there yet as far as our guidelines. What are barriers to getting to those outcomes? Uh, a big barrier is non-adherence. Um, I'm going to show you some data about the scope of that problem and who to, who's the at-risk group of patients that are non-adherent. Side effects to medical therapy, inadequate monitoring uh, or and or in a, inadequate access to care. Uh, from a physician standpoint, non-adherence with published guidelines and evidence-based medicine or even uh, being unaware of published guidelines in certain areas. Poor patient education. Discordance, which is this concept. So if a patient came in to see Peter and Peter said, you know, you're doing real well, uh, having four to six stools a day and the patient walks out like I'm miserable, I can't go to work. There's discordance there, right? You know, Peter's assessment and the patient's assessment of disease activity isn't gelling. So ideally for better patient outcomes, you want concordance in your views and your views on the patient's status. And then coexisting psychiatric disease, narcotic use, um, superimposed IBS are barriers to achieving good outcomes. So this is uh, some data from Meta C, which pub Meta C, which published in a red journal in 2003, that looks at non-adherence in IBD patients. And, so, and overall, uh, about 40% of patients were non-adherent. Importantly, most of those occurrences of non-adherence were unintentional. But there was a significant number of patients that purposely didn't take their medications. And that may be for reasons such as cost, uh, fear of side effects, unclear, unclear um, reason why they're taking the medication, but the primary, uh, the highest percentage of patients who don't take their meds do so unintentionally. This is from Susie Kane, who's really the adherence guru, also published in the Red Journal two years earlier, again showing that forgetfulness was really the main factor as far as non-adherence, and lack of perceived benefit was affecting about a fifth. And this was a chronic colitis a uh, cohort of about 100 patients, and importantly, 59 of 99 were non-adherent to therapy. So non-adherence is a big problem, especially in a chronic colitis model. What factors are associated with non-adherence? And this is summarized from uh, three publications. So younger age patients, those who have quiescent disease. Uh, so if you're not reminded about how bad your disease is, you won't take your meds. If you haven't had disease for a long time, which makes sense because you haven't learned that if you don't take your meds, you're going to get in trouble. For some reason, failure to schedule a follow-up appointment, I don't really intuitively understand why that's associated with non-adherence. Discordance, uh, being a male, uh, being on more than four meds, being single, 
three times daily dosing, and full-time employment. So your bad player is a young, single male who's working. So that's a very good predictive factor of someone who's not going to take their medicines correctly. And the next question to be, well, well, who cares? Does that matter? And at least in a chronic ulcerative colitis model, it does matter. So those patients who take 80% of their meds or more have a flare rate of about 15%, whereas those who take less than that have a flare rate of about 60%. So it makes a big difference if you're able to get patients to take the majority of their medicines. And then this is actually from uh, Fadia uh, Shaya from University of Maryland um, School of Pharmacy, and she did this work with Russ Cohen looking at the financial impact of really non-adherence. So they just termed it persistence and non-persistence with medications. But importantly, in the non-persistent group, if you just sort of look across the different bar graphs, uh, they, cost our, they cost our system more money. And that's presumably through flares and diagnostics and so forth that are associated with patients that are flaring. So non-adherent patients are more expensive than adherent patients. So this, is, um, this was an interesting study. So this is flipping adherence around to, to us, to providers. So how adherent are we with practice guidelines? And so what Reddy et al. did, and this was, I think, at, um, at the Harvard Health System, um, they took referrals um, into their system and they looked at their referring doctors perform uh, adherence to practice guidelines. So interesting when you pu publish this, I'm sure that the referring doctors were not thrilled that this made it to publication, but in the right column you're looking at the percent that are adherent to, to guidelines. So optimal dose of 5-ASA, we could quibble about whether that's important, but only 36 percent of docs maximized 5-ASA dosing only 25% use topical 5-ASA, 23% use steroids longer, or only 23% use steroids for less than three months, only 41% adopted steroid sparing agents, optimal immunomodulator dose only in 18%, adequate uh, measures to prevent bone disease in 22, and of course, not surprising, they do better with colorectal cancer screening, it's about 67%. So I would argue that's pretty dismal performance, by us as providers. Now, I don't mean us as referral docs, but at least in the community, it seems like we're not following guidelines as far as how to manage patients with IBD. And this uh, follows along nicely with some quality measures that are being proposed. And this is from, um, uh, from um, quality initiatives from the AGA looking at 10 measures that are thought to be associated with quality. So these are some things that may be tied to reimbursement in the future, such as knowing the type of IBD, the anatomic location, and disease activity that you assess that. That seems like a pretty easy thing that we can do in, in clinic. Um, using steroid sparing therapy, assessing for bone loss, uh, influenza, pneumococcal immunization, testing for latent TB and Hep B before initiating anti-TNF, testing for C. diff, and pay inpatients with diarrhea, DVT prophylaxis for inpatients, and screening for tobacco use and intervention, which you could argue should be for any patient in any clinic for any disease state. You should be screening for tobacco use. So these are some quality measures that we're going to be tested on uh, that are, well, that are thought to be associated with quality. What about drug side effects? So uh, in general, this is old data from JAMA from 2003. Uh, the rate of adverse drug reactions is about 50 per thousand, of which 38 percent were serious or life-threatening and about a quarter were preventable. That's just in general overall. That's not IBD specific. If you look at an inpatient GI referral center, about 25 percent of patients have adverse drug reactions and 37 percent are not recognized. Now if you want to hone it in more specifically to IBD, David Binion compared early adverse reactions to uh, azathioprine 6-MP compared to an autoimmune hepatitis uh, population and found that there was a high rate of early adverse reaction, approximately 30 percent in the IBD population. So, uh, there's, and I think this is real, there is something about our IBD patients, they seem to be very predisposed to adverse drug, uh, drug effects. Um, so it's a, it's a problem. So when I was in Milwaukee with David Binion as a fellow, uh, hand searching through almost 300 charts with Crohn's, one of the projects he had me look at was polypharmacy, which we defined as 
use of five or more drugs and the impact on patients' disease activity and quality of life. Sort of simple, simple project that frankly I would do a little differently if I was doing it now, but um, we looked at the initial visit and then the first follow-up visit and the take-home message here is over 50% of patients were on five or more meds. And remember, the average age of our patients is about 40, 41 years old, so that's a high number of medications. So that's a group of patients going back to non-adherence that are at risk for not taking their meds. And what was the impact on disease activity? So you could sort of see a dose response. So the number, the greater number of medications, the higher the disease activity index is measured by the Harvey Bradshaw index. And if you're not familiar with this, the scores uh, five or greater are associated with active disease. So uh, when you get up to five, you're at a score of six. And you also, we also saw a decline in quality of life with the more medications that patients were on. Lastly, we identified a group of patients that the only intervention Dr. Binion did at that time was to stop medication. He didn't add anything, he didn't do anything different, he just stopped medication. So what was the impact in that small cohort of about 10% of patients seen in the referral center? What you can see in that cohort is there was a sharp reduction in disease activity and a rise in quality of life just by stopping meds. And so a common example would be 5-ASA hypersensitivity driving symptoms. You see that in occasionally. So those are good examples. Maybe azathioprine side effects that aren't recognized. Uh, you stop them, patients feel better. Um, so that's just an example of the impact of side effects on our patients. Uh, in a log logistic regression analysis, we find, found that older age, not surprisingly, duration of disease and female gender were associated with major polypharmacy. There's some problems with that study. Um, it doesn't mean that drugs per se are bad. Uh, drugs could be a marker just for really bad disease. So there's certainly some confounding factors there. And we tried to um, get at that in the subsequent prospective study that I did with a, a doctoral student um, uh, at our school of pharmacy. Uh, so we used this side effect survey that my research mentor at the time had used in depression and hypertension. It's a multi-component survey. Um, it has a, a side effects index, general distress, duration, which are a visual analog scale, overall distress, and overall disability, which are all visual analog scales. And I'm going to show you data from the side effect index. Um, and this is all subjective patient reported side effects. So typically, we would give them cues. So do your symptoms get worse when you take your meds? Do they get better when you reduce the dose or stop the meds? Do the symptoms recur when you rechallenge? So we gave them prompts as to what a side effect was, acknowledging that this is a very, very subjective exercise. And so we basically put our side effect scores in the turtiles, and we found that there, the, the more drugs patients were on, not surprisingly, the higher the uh, perceived side effects. We also found that, uh, and we did an adjusted disease activity index because we used the Harvey Bradshaw, and we used a simple clinical colitis activity index. You can't really use those together, so we did, an, we did an adjusted index out to 100, just for simplicity's sake. And we again found that disease activity scores went up with higher perceived side effects, and the quality of life went down. And when we tried to do some adjusted analyses there, um, based on number of medications, what we found is that there were still some impact on general quality of life, even when we adjusted for multiple medications. So, there's something there with side effects. It's a problem. I'm not sure I have a great solution for it other than to be, be aware that it's out there and be open-minded to doing a trial off of medications and see how your patients respond. What about knowledge? So how, how good are your patients? So this is sort of akin to Animal House as far as how your patients score. So this is a really cool study published in IBD in 2003. They did three-hour workshops in multiple U.S. communities and they used a validated questionnaire called the CC No, prior to, after, and then three months after the workshop. And this is their baseline score, so this is percent correct. So IBD complications, 34%, medications, 36%, diet, they did better, 65%, and general knowledge, 61%. So that's what you're dealing with in clinic as far as your patient education about their disease. Now after the short-term three-hour workshop, the short-term uh, response, 
they did get about a 19% bump, but that dropped to 11% after three months. So there really was some sustained benefit of education, which I would argue three hours is pretty intense, but there wasn't any sort of longitudinal cues to keep the education going. So our patients generally don't know a lot about their illness. So I, I think to summarize, that it's clear that there's some unmet need. There's areas that don't necessarily involve new drugs or combinations of drugs that we can improve outcomes. So can we improve care through application of social science? So there's a couple models that I think are particularly relevant. Uh, one is the health belief model and one is the chronic care model. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I'm just going to point out some areas where telemedicine can have a positive impact. So this is the health belief model, which is the most commonly used theory in health education and promotion. And it just it's, says that health behavior is determined by personal beliefs and the disease and strategies available to decrease it its occurrence. So this is more about promotion. This is more about prevention in some ways. But if you think about a stable patient who you're trying to prevent a flare, flare it may apply. So there's some things that telemedicine can, um, uh, can help with. One is perceived susceptibility to disease, or if you substitute disease for flare, uh, perceived severity of disease. So I'm going to show you some of our, our green zones, yellow zones, and red zones. It'll cue people to how sick they are. Uh, that also ties in the threat of disease. Cues to action, this will fall in line with our action plan. And then perceived benefits versus perceived barriers. So I think telemedicine can address some of those areas. This is the chronic care model of Wagner, uh, which focuses more on chronic illnesses, which is very applicable to what we're talking about. And it emphasizes six components. I'm going to show you how telemedicine can implement team care. Uh, planned interaction, self-management, support, all telemed telemedicine does that. Community resources, we can link to community resources. Integrated decision to support, which is what we have. And then uh, patient registries and other supportive information technology. You can imagine that we could link to something like CCFA Partners, uh, which is a very good patient registry. So uh, I think telemedicine can fulfill many of these chronic care model requirements of Wagner. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we do implement team care. We have an educational platform. We monitor severity of disease. Uh, we reduce barriers by more frequent interactions, even though it's artificial in some sense with a computer screen. We have action plans. Uh, we have frequent reminders to improve patient confidence in what they're doing. And we have the uh, decision support, evidence-based uh, treatment and we do have uh, support of IT. So we, I think telemedicine can address many of these issues. Um, what about telemedicine and GI? So we could talk about diabetes and asthma and heart failure. There's lots of research in those areas. What about in digestive diseases? So uh, we recently did a book chapter on this, um, a, a qualitative review. There is a little bit of data out there in irritable bowel syndrome patients. So one was an application of an abbreviated symptom questionnaire for IBS, and the other was using a model to provide web-based cognitive behavioral therapy, which was effective. And they found that that was actually in a follow-up study that was sustained over time. The other big areas in hepatitis C and doing teleconsults with prison systems, televisits in California, improving provider knowledge, um, teleconferencing between hepatology and primary care in New Mexico, and they found that with teleencounters versus face-to-face, -face, there were no difference in outcome for hep C. So lots and lots of research about expanding hep C treatment. So there is some evidence base in other diseases other than IBD. So what about for IBD specifically? So this was a study published in the Red Journal in 2011. Uh, I, I, talk, I think I talked about this with the fellows yesterday, but this was a randomized control trial of veterans. Um, they were doing a telemedicine encounter with a remote IBD specialist at the San Francisco VA and versus standard encounters at the Palo Alto VA. And so what they did basically is the fellow would see the veteran at Palo Alto if they were randomized to the televisit. They would then go into some 
workstation room where they had access to the consultant at the San Francisco VA, radiologist, pathologist if necessary. They would discuss the case. They would go back then to the exam rooms which were equipped to do televisits and the consultant would have a televisit with the fellow and with the patient. Um, both groups like their clinic experience. I want to point out a couple factors that would be unlikely to be successful here at Michigan or at Maryland. The total clinic duration for both visits was about an hour. Uh, my guess is that Peter doesn't take an hour to see his patients. Um, the wait times were about the same and the median number of patients per clinic was about four to five. So not a very busy clinic, but at least proof of concept that you could do, you could get access as far as access to care, you could access an IBD specialist at another center and implement that in a veteran population. So there have been some good studies by Pia Monkholm's group in um, ulcerative colitis in a mild to moderate ulcerative colitis population. So this was a randomized controlled trial published in GUT in 2010. Uh, they looked at 333 patients from Denmark and Ireland. And the, you know, the results is a little bit uh, hard to follow at times because they keep separating the Denmark and the, and the, um, the two uh, countries into the results. So they report things by country. But in general, what they did here is they had a web group, and I put the link in for constant care. And patients and their relatives receive a three-hour educational training session on the disease, as well as how to use the website. When they're flaring, they get daily monitoring with the telemedicine system until they enter the green zone. And then weekly for one month, after resolution and they do quality of life in a similar manner but a little less frequently. Um, they primary their action plans are to optimize oral 5-ASA dosing to use topicals both and in a select group of patients to use prednisolone and then they had a control group that didn't have access to this. They did study visits at baseline six months and 12 months they had a, a low completion rate of only 41%, which is going to, I'm going to show you our study was as similar. I can't really explain why, the, the, why they had so much loss to follow up. In the Danish arm, they had, um, the web group was more adherent to the acute treatment, so when they were flaring, the acute, the adherence was 73% versus 42%. There was no difference, however, overall in the patients who had quiescent disease. The web group had better improvements in knowledge and quality of life. There was no difference in flare rates, but they did see that the relapses were shorter, significantly shorter in the web group. In the Irish arm, they also had better adherence to acute treatment, improved quality of life. They had a higher relapse rate in the web group, but they again, the relapses were of shorter duration. And they looked at a couple other measures. They had less acute care and routine visits uh, compared to the standard group but they did have a higher number of emails and phone calls, which currently are not reimbursable. So they were, they were trading some encounters with virtual encounters, I suppose. So that was, uh, that's clearly the biggest trial uh, that's been done uh, in IBD uh, using telemedicine. Now what, what's, what is our system? So this is not actually my desk. My desk is big, much bigger than this, and I have two screens, but this is a virtual model of my desk. So this would be the provider's PC with a computer. This is a laptop with a scale going through to the USB port. And in our old model, uh, the results were, using a, were transmitted over a telephone line to our server, where a provider, nurse, could see the results instantaneously. Um, and that's sort of our system for information flow. The laptop itself uh, were refurbished laptops that were uh, constructed only to do the telemanagement program. Uh, they contained a symptom diary, um, a medication adherence check, a side effect inventory, assessment of body weight, which had audio cues, um, and a patient educational curriculum. And the format of that, would we would give an educational tip on, let's say, tomorrow and the following week they would get a question based on the tip and they have to get the question right to keep advancing and getting more tips and more questions. Uh, the web portal contains alerts and action plans which you can customize. So if you have an IBS patient who always has 
loose stools and pain, you can, you can turn down the sensitivity of the system so you don't get alerted all the time. You make the threshold a little higher so that you, you're not just getting garbage out from the system. You also can do a customized med, customized med list. You can follow what you want. You can just follow the 5ASA or you can follow everything. And you can see data trends with the system. So this is, look how old these laptops were. So this is, uh, we never used these for any of my studies, but that's one of the systems that Joe Finkelstein was using and it's just showing someone completing self-testing with the scale. This is an example of one of our questions about abdominal pain and patients can use the arrows uh, to toggle down and select their answer. This is an example of an adherence question about asulfidine. So typically for weekly testing, we would ask how many tablets of asulfidine they took uh, in the week so they could again use the arrows to toggle up or down on a number of tablets and then we would set adherence as defined as 80% or more. This is one of our, um, this is just a sample alert screen. So here I can put in a total score of what I want the alert to be, a subscore based on a few critical symptoms, compliance, compliance not only to meds but testing, and then I can look at a number of side effects, any of which they report would trigger an alert, and we can look at change in body weight. Uh, so these are how you can customize your alert system. And this is an example of a patient from our six-month pilot who had indeterminate colitis who had a precipitous drop in weight which was heralding his flare. And we actually intervened early in this patient and treated him aggressively and got him back into remission. But these are some of the trends. This is just in weight, but you also could look at symptoms. You can look at adherence. All of this you can see with trending on the website. So. What about our study? So the first study that I did, we just looked at a convenient sample of 10 patients uh, from the University of Maryland. Very simple, they received a 30 minute instruction session. So they did self-testing self with assistance first, self-testing with assistance on request, and then they did self-testing without assistance. At the end of the uh, training session, we just did an attitudinal survey and a structured qualitative interview. I'm not gonna show you the structured qualitative interview, I'm just gonna show you the attitudinal survey. So very simple little pilot project. And what I want you to focus on is that patients didn't think the self-testing was complicated. They didn't think it was difficult working with the computer. It didn't take much time. Uh, they thought that they could do this as often as four times a week. Um, most would feel safer using such a, such a system and most would want to look at something like this again. So we were very encouraged that uh, patient um, perceptions of the system were positive. So we had a little bit of funding from the School of Medicine and from the VA to do a six month pilot. <clears throat> so this was a quasi experimental uh, design. So this is a pre and post test study of six months duration and it was a mix of Crohn's, indeterminate colitis and ulcerative colitis from University of Maryland and the Baltimore VA and all patients had weekly assessment with the home telemanagement system and our primary outcome was just feasibility. So we just wanted to show the patients could be 80% adherent with the system over six months and we also did attitudinal surveys again as a primary outcome. Secondary outcomes were disease activity, quality of life and disease knowledge and I'm going to show you some of those outcomes as well. We recruited 34 patients Five didn't comply with installation, so because this is over a telephone line, uh, you actually have one of the technicians has to go to the house to install it. Our new system is not gonna be like that, so that explains probably why we lost five right away. Two didn't have a telephone at home, which is unexpected. I would guess that that's much higher now with people using cell phones primarily. Two withdrew. One of the patients that withdrew, we actually picked up a fever with the telemedicine system. She had a spinal epidural abscess. We picked it up by calling and speaking to her mother. We sent her to the, they called the ambulance, sent her to the, sent her to the hospital and she's done well. So we actually picked up an adverse, it wasn't an adverse event, she wasn't really on any, any significant drugs, but uh, we picked up that event with the telemedicine system. We had 25 that completed the protocol. Most of these patients had moderate to severe disease. They had a mean education level of 13 years, but despite that, 32% reported limited knowledge about Crohn's and colitis. And uh, about half used a computer only once a week or less. So this wasn't really a computer savvy 
population that we had. So what were our results? 91% of people were adherent with the protocol over six months. Only three completed less than 80% of the self-testing sessions. Uh, patients thought it was uncomplicated. They thought using the scale and symptom diary was, was not difficult. Uh, over half would feel safer using such a system and 91% uh, would use it in the, in the future. So we got good, good feedback from the pilot and then we were very encouraged by these results. So we found that, now we may argue that some of these changes aren't clinically relevant, but we did see a decline in Harvey Bradshaw index from a score of 3.8 to 2.2. We saw a rise in quality of life from 49 to 55 and we saw a modest improvement in patient knowledge going from nine questions correct to 12 after use of the system. So we're seeing good trending with our, with our data. So we then, for our Broad Foundation grant that I had, we, we basically modified the system to be specific for ulcerative colitis because it's hard to lump all these patients together. Um, we modified the symptom diary and the alerts to make it specific for UC. We added these action plans that I'm going to show you. We developed a messaging system and we added a cell phone platform so patients could do this on cell phones as opposed to having a, a landline at home. This is how informa information flows. So you have the patient down here who does their self-testing with the unit. It gets transmitted to the server, to the portal. The results can be viewed by the provider immediately, but if any alerts are reached, it goes to the nurse coordinator immediately. Um, in addition, if there are certain criteria are met, yellow and red zone plans go to the subject immediately. So patients get immediate, immediate feedback even if it's 2 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. They can, they can know exactly what we want them to do. <coughs> Ideally, your nurse coordinator is going to then come up with a management plan with the provider and communicate it back to the patient. So that's how information is supposed to flow with the system. This is an example of a yellow zone patient. So you would imagine this is a patient who's starting to struggle starting to miss work, starting to miss social activities. At Maryland, patients always miss, social, always miss work before social activities. So, but this would be a yellow zone patient. So if they say they feel poor, they have four to six movements a day, one to three awakenings at night, or more than trace blood in the stool, any of these would trigger this action plan. And as a provider, I can select any one of these actions. So you can see this, this fits really well with a mild to moderate UC patient um, in optimizing five ASAs. It's a select number of patients that I would start on prednisone. Uh, in the infliximab patients, maybe you just want to do an early infusion or change dose. Uh, you're not going to obviously do that at night and on the weekend, but the following Monday when you return, you can institute these. So these are the actions that you can pick. If you feel very poor or terrible, have more than seven movements a day, have uh, greater than three nocturnal awakenings, then you're in the red zone, um, so you can select one of these actions. Most of the red zone patients, the answer is going to be, the, end, the action is going to be call, call the office, call the on-call call service. There's very few people I feel comfortable starting steroids right away. But this is an example of what their action plans would look like. So we did a, another 10 patient convenience sample, and again, patients thought that these modifications they were well received. So we were encouraged. We used all this preliminary data for our, Bro for our Broad grant, which funded our trial. This is focusing on difficulty using the system. This focuses on safety and would you use it in the future. So we were very encouraged. So this was our research model, model for the randomized trial. So we had two groups, home telemanagement weekly versus best available care. Best available care with standard follow-up, as needed phone calls, as needed clinic visits, and we gave them um, written action plans without reinforcement, and we gave them, gave them educational fact sheets from the CCFA. That was what we considered best available care. Um, we looked at primarily disease activity, quality of life, and adherence, and we tried to do an exploratory aim to look at healthcare utilization, uh, which we, we, do, we really didn't have enough data to look at that, but we certainly looked at disease activity, quality of life, and adherence. Um, our objectives were to compare disease activity between the two groups, as well as quality of life, as well as adherence and healthcare utilization. 
We did a randomized, uh, con randomized clinical trial of 12 months. Uh, the intervention was weekly telemanagement. So we again used some participants from our Baltimore VA. Uh, and we stratified patients for disease activity at baseline when we did the randomization. We used the SAIL index for disease activity. For those of you not familiar with this, this is a um, symptom-based questionnaire that gives you a numerical value similar to the CDAI. It does not require sigmoidoscopy. We used the IBDQ for quality of life. We used, there's no perfect measure of adherence. We used a Marisky medication adherence a scale which has since been debunked a bit as far as its accuracy in IBD. And for healthcare utilization, we just simply looked at ER visits, hospitalizations, and length of stay. So very simple measures. These were our um, timelines. So we looked at baseline four months, eight months, and 12 months. Um, we tried also to get a little bit of refill data, which we sort of, we didn't do well with that. But that was our plan, was to try to look at some of their pharmacy refill data. This is our patient flow through the study. We had 55 patients agree to participate. Uh, eight withdrew prior to first study visit. Um, I think this is trying to make doctor happy syndrome. So yes, I'll do it, but then no, I won't when the coordinator calls to set things up. Um, we randomized 22 to best available care, 25 to UC HAT. <clears throat> Four didn't receive intervention or withdrew in the BAC arm, and we had 11 withdrawal or didn't receive intervention in the UC arm. And we're going to talk about that a little later, why we had a higher dropout rate. So if you look at some of Peter's stuff, looking at patients vote with their feet as they move through the trial, it would look just on appearance that UC HAT wasn't as good as best available care. We had 16 out of 22 finish in BAC and 14 out of 25 in UC HAT. This was our trial demographics, so no difference in age. Uh, we had mostly women in our study, uh, primarily a Caucasian population. Um, about half had pancolitis. The one thing to really focus on here is it looks like the telemedicine group, if I can get my arrow to pop up, was sicker. So about 56% of the people in this patients in this arm were on immune suppressants compared to 26% of the BAC. Uh, no difference in biologic use. So randomization was a, a bit imperfect, at least for that for that, for that um, variable. So these are our results at baseline, four months, eight months, and 12 months. HAT is in red. So you see at baseline, the HAT patients were sicker. I put 120, that's the threshold for remission uh, with the SAIL index. And you can see sort of that with HAT, disease activity is dropping, and it seems to be fairly stable in the BAC group. There was no significant difference between the groups at any time point at baseline or thereafter. We did look, when we did adjusted analyses, adjusted for their baseline quality of life, and looking at difference in scores from baseline between groups, we found that there was about a 12-point reduction in SAIL index scores in the HAT group compared to a 1.2 reduction in, this, in the best available care group, uh, which was trending towards significance. So, we were sort of encouraged by that, that there was an a, a improvement in disease activity. This is looking at remission rates. There was no difference between the, between the groups at any time point. The remission rates overall were fairly high. Quality of life, there's, big difference, there's a big difference in quality of life between the BAC and the HAC group. Um, the HAC group was just above the sort of the threshold that correlates with remission, but it was a big difference in the BAC group. You can see over time we had improvement that sort of leveled off in HAT, whereas it sort of went up and then leveled again in the BAC group. So we also did adjusted analyses for this, again, looking at change from baseline. And at 12 months, the UC HAT group had um, almost a 15-point improvement in quality of life. And anywhere from 16 to 32 is considered uh, meaningful. So. Uh, we, we saw improvements in quality of life, and we didn't really see that in the best available care arm. Adherence was, and using the Marisky adherence scale was low in all arms, and it didn't look like telemedicine had any impact. Um, so how do I interpret those results? So let's, let's talk about the dropout rate. So why did that occur? Um, 
So these were refurbished, cheap laptop systems to make it cost effective. And if they got bumped, moved, they would stop working, needed a technical visit, we'd get interruptions in care. Sometimes patients got frustrated because uh, this, uh, my, invet my uh, uh, mentor had multiple projects going at once, so we weren't always as timely as we needed to be. And I think if we deliver this system in a smarter way through desktops at home, through smartphone, I think adherence with the protocol or uh, being able to get patients through the protocol will be more successful. That's my hypothesis. Number two, were the two groups equal at baseline? It seemed like the hack group patients, although still sort of looking like they were in remission, they clearly were sicker participants. Um, so I, I don't think they were really quite equal at baseline. We weren't really powered with a study of that size to detect small to moderate differences. Um, so it's possible if we recruited more patients that we would have seen, um, I think, still meaningful results. Did we select the wrong patients? So is this the right group? Should we be looking at a referral population or should we be going into the community practices to implement this? Should we be looking at patients who just recently flared? Should we be looking at people who have shown that they're non-adherent? So should we be looking at a specific subgroup or just looking at people overall? And then I think you have to consider that telemedicine just doesn't improve outcomes to pair, compared to best available care in a referral center. Um, it's possible it doesn't work. Um, despite that, the reviewers from AHRQ were encouraged, and so they funded us to do an R01 between our site, Pitt, and Vanderbilt to assess the impact of tele-IBD. We're changing the name uh, as I'm separating from my mentor, and we're going to again look at disease activity, quality of life, and healthcare utilization. Specifically, in our Care First patients from Maryland, we have a letter of agreement with Care First. We're actually going to look at real-time utilization data in that subgroup, so that should be uh, pretty interesting. So this is my very complicated model. How, how can you improve care that doesn't involve new drug development? So there's some patient, there's some interaction factors between patients and physicians that we can work on. Uh, collaborating with patients, developing a, an individualized plan and dis decreasing discordance. From a physician per, a perspective, we can try to find ways to educate especially community docs, more about guidelines and quality measures and getting them to adhere to guidelines. From a patient perspective, we can focus on education, trying to recognize and reduce drug side effects, improve adherence, improve monitoring, and this psychosocial component is a big part that I left out, uh, but that's an area where I think we can improve outcomes. And then I think maybe not my system, maybe not Pia Munkholm's system, but systems to help monitor patient novel approaches, technology, uh, doing CalPros at home, you know, sending CalPros in, things like that to enhance monitoring are going to be, I think, the wave of the future to help the things that we have now work better. And that's it. That's, that's all I have. I left about 10 minutes. This is our team at, our team at Maryland, including gastroenterologists, surgeons, and coordinators, and admins. Any, uh, any questions? What do you think it is about adherence that makes the needle so tough to move? What, what can you do for the next iteration to try to move So I don't think the Mariski is very good. So for those of you who haven't used the Mariski, it's just a four-item questionnaire. And if a patient answers affirmative to any of the items, you're considered non-adherent. So I'm trying to think an example of a question is, did you miss a dose of medicine? If you answer yes to that, you're not adherent. But who doesn't miss a dose, right? Or have you ever doubled a dose to make up for something? I mean, it's not a very good marker. Uh, pharmacy refills are one thing. Um, you know, the caps, the caps to measure adherence, all of them have problems. Um, it may not work. Um, I, I would think that if you're monitoring and you're, and you're getting prompted frequently about your meds, it's, the frequent cues would help. But I haven't proven that. I haven't proven that this system will make take their patients take their meds more. The European group hasn't either, except when they're sick. Um, and I, I guess it, it's the feedback, that frequent feedback about how sick you are is prompting people, take your meds, take your meds, take your meds. But 
in the quiescent patients that feel well, even the telemonitoring didn't appear to help them. So I, I don't know. It's a tough nut to crack. Ellen? Um, you know, I think there are a lot of uh, college students, and I think I might know or have an idea at least why this people didn't take to this and there was a high drop out there. I don't think people, particularly young people, like to be reminded on a daily basis that they have this chronic disease. And, and I think what, the older you get, the more accepting you are of being defined by your disease. But young people definitely do not want to be defined by their disease. And, and I think that that that, that somehow we think ulcerative colitis adherence and medication and, and following symptoms closely and jumping on top of symptoms is like the end all to care. But I, I think that patients may have a different idea about that. And, and so I, this doesn't surprise me at all. I think, I think it's very likely that people do not want to be reminded on a daily basis that they have a chronic disease. Yeah, I don't know if we ever looked at the dropout rate by age. Um, I can tell you anecdotally that when, so we had all our, our randomization was sealed, sealed in an envelope, and whenever I would recruit a patient, I would open it. The, all the patients I wanted in the hack group didn't go in the hack group. They went in the BAC group. All the patients I wanted in BAC went in the, I mean, you shouldn't want patients to be in any group, but the patients I knew were going to do what I wanted them to do went in the BAC, and the problem patients all went in hack. Now, you could look at that as an opportunity, like if you can make those patients do what you want them to do, that's, that's a good selling point. But, I mean, I obviously can't write that in the paper, that, you know, the randomization put people on the hat arm that I didn't like. Um, did, this, did this have a weight component to it, too? Was there a weight, was there a scale on this yeah. particular? There was. I mean, I, we were talking a little bit before that I think, you know, it's sort of obvious, too, that particularly women don't want to weigh themselves every day. Reminded every day of their weight. It's the same sort of phenomenon. Yeah, his 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 model with the telemanagement was you always have to have an objective measure. So he did peak flows at home for the res uh, respiratory diseases, and weight seemed to be natural. Now I was talking to Ryan about you know CalPro about whether you could have that be your objective measure, either the you know the cell phone based system where you can take a picture of the fluorescence and get an approximate measure or what you're doing with the cards that are being assessed. So there's other ways of doing it. That may be a factor. We're also in the, in the trial, we're also going to do an every other week arm, and maybe less frequency would be better for compliance. I, I really think the main, the, one of the main issues, this system was way too clunky. It has to be convenient and easy. And if you're having a problem, you have to be able to call and speak to a live person and get immediate an immediate fix. If it takes a week or two to fix it, you're done. You've already lost them. But we'll look at the age as well and see if that's a major factor. Um, I wonder if that group will respond more. Now your point is they don't want to be reminded, but I wonder if they would respond more to different technologies like cell phones um, as opposed to being on a, I mean, tablets, cell phones. I don't know. We're, we're going we're gonna to try some things with this new trial and see how they work out. Yes? And we didn't really show education improved either, so that system didn't work for this. So we talked about a couple strategies for this trial. Um, one was doing some recorded educational sessions, taking a core set of topics, and maybe monthly in the telemedicine groups have them view sort of an educational seminar that we would have as a webcast for them. Uh, I, think, I think what we're going to do instead is basically give them tweets and make it very practical. I've sort of focused on, God, they have to know what villi are, and they have to know how many feet their small intestine are, and what a sulfidine is, and like all these things that I think are important, but I think we're gonna try to do much, much more practical tweets, like it's flu season, you need, if you're on these drugs, you need your flu shot, we're gonna give try practical education. 
and that's not going to probably move their, their educational score, but it might give them practical knowledge to make them uh, more educated patients and improve quality of life and disease activity. So we're going to try to do more tweeting type stuff to them as opposed to what we did with the tip and the follow-up question. And I don't know that that's going to work, but we're going to try that. When you might try it, it sounds simple, but have a little video on how to set your smartphone alarm to remind you to take the medicine. You know, here's how to set your smartphone alarm on an iPhone. Here's how to set it on an Android phone. It's amazing how many patients don't know how to set the alarm on their phone. Yeah, you know, I was talking to Ryan, too. I think maybe trying to add some CalPro or something like that periodically would be another objective measure that we could that we could add. I mean, the reviewers thought we were asking too much, so what I showed you is pared down. Like, they didn't want us to ask any of the psychosocial stuff, which I thought was important. I think it's a lost opportunity to not ask them about anxiety, depression, social constraint. I mean, we're not asking them to do that many visits. It's baseline six and 12 months, and those, it shouldn't take that long to do those kind of forms. But I think adding some stuff like that to see the impact on the psychosocial part of the disease, maybe trying to get something super objective like a CalPro that where they wouldn't have to come to the office to give it would still be sort of home monitoring in a sense. So I think there's in the six months we're going to have from the beginning of October to uh, the spring when we need to start recruiting, we have some time to try, not much time, but we have some time to consider what we want to ask and what other things we can possibly include in this to get the most, you know, it would be a lost opportunity to learn to do the trial and get 300 and some patients in there and not ask all the right questions and not be thoughtful. Yes? I was just wondering, if, and it may have been back in some of your slides, is it's been looked at if patients kind of want telemedicine. Like if, if given a choice between seeing a person in the clinic versus having a managed um, distantly through telemedicine, which one they would choose. A lot of my patients, especially the older ones, seem to see like the, the visit as kind of a social visit too, and they might kind of perceive that, you know, if they're not seeing me on a regular basis, We didn't, we didn't limit them to, to not come in. So when we randomized them, it wasn't telemedicine only. Telemedicine was an adjunct. Now, they have done some studies in England where they did self-management, where they got no follow-up. They got written action plans after hospitalization. That group actually did quite well without any follow-up in clinic. We didn't do that. I didn't go that far. We still had regular visits for these patients but the telemedicine was the adjunctive part. Um, I'm sure we have somewhere what percent of patients we, we asked about the trial and said no. Um, I think it depends. If it's me asking, there's a small percentage that say no, but some of my partners, it's a higher percentage. Um, I think patients think it's cool and interesting. I'm really interested in Ellen's point about the age of the patient and whether that makes it different. I'm going to pay particular attention to that. Um, but I think they're pretty receptive. Um, I haven't done a survey to ask them, is this something you want? I guess we'll see if we, we have 18 months to recruit 375 patients at three sites. So if we can pull that off, I would think it's pretty, patients are pretty enthusiastic. Um, all right, thank you.